All right, guys. Bang, bang. I've got Mike here with me. Thank you so much for doing this, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the invite. For sure. Let's, uh, let's jump right into your background. Kind of tell us what did you do before you found crypto? And then how did you find Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? Yeah, so if we go all the way back, I was born and raised in Rochester, New York. And so I grew up just pouring concrete, you know, carrying blocks and uh, learned a lot about hard work and passion. My dad had a lot of passion for that business. Uh, so what it was like to have a small company and uh, basically work ends. And, the, um, and I think the other part in my early beginning was my mom is from Iceland. So she uh, came to this country when she was eight, 18 and she left a family of 18. And just recently, I've been thinking about how risky that was. And I think some of the risks I've taken throughout my life probably come from her as a, an example of that. Um, and then I went to, my dad said, you want to take over the company? And I'm like, no, I want to go to college. And uh, I went and got a civil engineering degree and an MBA at the University of Buffalo. And, uh, and then got on GE's leadership program, um, where I was a Six Sigma black belt, lean manufacturing. And then essentially the last 10 years of my career, I spent as a hired gun in the private equity world. Um, so kind of fixing companies. Uh, so that's, you know, my quick, quick background. What, Not your what typical some, crypto background, I guess. What are some of the biggest lessons that you learned as a hired gun? Like when you would go into these broken companies, what are some of the things that uh, were kind of immediate? We got to fix this stuff. And so one was, um, you know, setting a clear vision and tapping into the, kind of the passion of the, of the people. And then I think the other, the other big item was, you know, you got to have the right people in the right seats. So it was a lot of focus around talent, talent, talent. And then, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that if, if you get people that are excited about their jobs, they're going to, they're going to give it their all and you give them some freedom and they typically over deliver. I, uh, I tend to agree with that for sure. How did you yeah. first come across uh, cryptocurrencies? So the, the first, so I would say um, in 2000, I think it was June of 2017, uh, I was in between assignments and my wife asked me to take the summer off. She's like, just stop. Cause I'd just been going, you know, like 20 years, just not, you know, crazy. And uh, so we took the whole family to Italy for a family vacation. I read a great book, uh, Homo Deus um, by Yuval Harari. I don't know if you've, if you've read that or not, but it's kind of about the future of how mankind and technology come together and evolve. And literally we got home and I read an article about blockchain. I'm like, wait, this is exactly what he's talking about. And it reminded me of the start of the internet. You know, so I was in college, like when Netscape came out, like early, early, early days. And, you know, the reality was I, I kind of, I chickened out. I should have moved to Silicon Valley. Instead, I kind of took the safe route and went to work at GE, which was, you know, like the big company at the time. And uh, I just thought, man, this, this doesn't happen. This blockchain technology fixes a lot of problems. And this doesn't happen very often in, in a lifetime. So I decided to to explore it further. And I basically spent like 15 hours a day going down the rabbit hole. Um, I think my wife thought I was going to be like serving her drinks out at the pool. Um, instead, I just sat at my computer all summer long and, and fell in love with crypto. I started trading it. And after about three weeks, I realized I'm not a really good trader, like too emotional. <laughs> and, uh, and then I fell in love with the mining space. I thought, wow, you really have to build out the infrastructure first before this thing's really going to scale. And it just made sense to me. Like I just, it just seemed like that's the first thing to go. So I literally poured everything I had into it and um, went full time, you know, and I, I have to give a little shout out to my, my buddies in uh, Buffalo. Cause there was a Buffalo blockchain startup group and I would drive out to Buffalo every Tuesday to meet with these guys. And Talk about a fish out of water. Like these, these guys are, they're software programmers, traders, investors. They knew tons. And I'm like the old guy in the room with a notepad, like writing down everything they're saying, just trying to keep up. And, and it was like, they're on Twitter and WeChat and WhatsApp and Signal and Telegram. And they're in these chat rooms with thousands of people just saying whatever they wanted. And it was, I was really out of my element, but um, I've come to, 
appreciate that that part of it. So, what, uh, what was the fascination, or like, what pulled you into the mining side of it all? Like, like I said, I think that it was you have to build the infrastructure first to to be able to scale. And I thought, um, I thought I can do that, right? Like, I'm an engineer. I understand how to 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 be efficient at at plugging in machines. And I, I just got, I could get my head wrapped around that concept more than like programming some blockchain application. You know, I, I, part of it, part of my journey, I thought, you know, at some point this is going to, this blockchain is going to come back into the traditional world. And since I spent most of my career in the traditional world, I thought if I could learn this new kind of technology, I could help bridge that gap. I still think we're years and years away from it, but I think the, the easiest place for me to make that leap was on the mining front. For sure. And maybe give us an overview where the mining industry is today in terms of um, kind of how big is this? Who are the players? Um, and then maybe geography wise, uh, is there things going on in North America, in Asia? There's kind of so many rumors. Like, how do you see mining as a business uh, in an industry? Yeah, and maybe I can tell part of that story as like how I kind of grew up in my journey. So I've I've been in the space for three years. Um, got a chance to run a small con- uh, company here in Western New York called Savage. We grew it from like one megawatt to three megawatts, which you know in late seventeen, early eighteen seemed like you know a monster, uh, a monster location. And then um, I knew the guys that started Core Scientific, and I went down to see what they were doing. And this is like early 2018 and they had built out like six megawatts in six weeks, which just kind of like, I was like, Whoa, these guys are moving fast. And they talked me into joining um, them and helping them kind of grow out their business. And over the next year, it scaled to a hundred megawatts. And then, um, and then about a year ago, Barry called and said, Hey, we're ready to get into the mining space. And would you like to come lead the team? So you know, mining has, you know, if you go back to the beginning, it was like any PC in the world you could mine Bitcoin with, right? And then it moved to GPUs. And then it got to these very specific computers, ASICs that that really only do one thing, but mine Bitcoin. And the scale just keeps growing faster and faster and faster, right? So, um, you know, one megawatt was huge four years ago. And then 20 megawatts was big three years ago. And now people are all talking about building 50 and 100 megawatt facilities. Um, so it just, it's moving, the, the space moves so, so quickly. Yeah. And so talk a little bit about DCG and Foundry, right? So you get this call from Barry. He goes, hey, we're going to get into mining. Uh, they're not an average investor uh, or, or a team. They've obviously made some very, very big plays and, and been super successful with uh, a lot of things they've done. What was your reaction when you got that phone call? And then kind of what have you guys done so far? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, being on the outside, always looking in, it was, it was like, wow, there's a lot of special things happening at DCG. So I was and they, they really avoided the mining space. And, uh, you know, the mining industry, you were, you were a miner, right? Didn't you mine a little bit um, in the early days? It's a tough industry. And it's like the wild, wild west. And there's a lot of interesting characters. And everyone's got a story. And you can't tell what's real and what's not real. And, you know, when I sat down with Barry, he basically said, look at this was my experience early in the early days and I just didn't want anything to do with it. Um, and then he goes, you know, about a year and a half ago, they tried to buy some machines, you know, not very many. And he goes, it, it hasn't changed much. And he just couldn't believe that the mining industry still operated that way. And he, and he just thought now's the time for it to kind of let's up the game around mining. And, uh, he said, let, he, he felt like it was the right time to, to, to bring in, you know, bigger capital, um, you know, to take a, so my job is really like, let's leverage the DCG balance sheet. Let's leverage its brand. Let's leverage its, its portfolio companies. And how do we create, um, solutions that can help the mining industry in North America? And he really is like, look, at, here's a blank sheet of paper. Tell me what this industry needs and where we can add the most value. And it didn't take long before we, we kind of came to the conclusion that we're getting ready to go through another cycle. 
There's new machines that are coming out. It's time for everybody to upgrade their equipment. And they just, there's not enough capital. And what's interesting is, you know, most of these machines are all manufactured in China. And the Chinese typically get the first, you know, crack at them. And you need, you need to make those, you need to make big bets early in the process to get to the head of the line. And we felt like this was the right time to do it. So, you know, back in January, when nobody really wanted to buy machines, we started making very big bets on new equipment um, so that we could get to the head of the line and that we could get our hands on the machines. So um, we, so that's what we're doing. We're, we're, we are helping miners in North America um, upgrade their facilities. And, uh, you know, we mine ourselves. That's not, you know, it's not our goal is to be the biggest miner. That's not what we're setting, up, we're, we're setting out to do. What are really our goal is to decentralize the hash rate around the world, right? Like how do we support these decentralized infrastructures? And, and I should know it's not just proof of work. It's also proof of stake, right? So we're, we've got a whole team doing um, proof of stake nodes and supporting kind of that new industry that's, that's starting to develop. So. Talk to me a little bit about this cycle um, that you're talking about, right? So um, there's the, kind of the price cycle, but there's also uh, lead times on building out hardware. Uh, I think it was like NVIDIA and a couple of other folks who had gotten into um, trying to build cards and, and GPUs and things like that really got kind of caught um, in the wrong side of the cycle in 2018, where, you know, 17, they saw this big boom in demand. They came to market with all kinds of hardware. Next thing you know, a lot of that demand had basically dissipated by the time that they actually got everything there. They had a bunch of inventory kind of on their hands and, and they weren't able to, um, you know, offload it in, in the price points and timing that they wanted. So maybe help people understand like where we are today. We're recording this in October of 2020. How do you see where we are now and the kind of what is the expectation or like, why did you think that 2020 was the year to start something like this? The cycles in the mining industry are brutal. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, why? And I think, I think you have to have different strategies for, you know, each part of the cycle. Um, Leo Zhang had did a, a nice research paper on this just recently. And he kind of talks about like the four cycles of the mining space. And um, part of it is like the Bitcoin algorithm is like the most efficient thing on the planet. And it's ruthless in terms of its desire to keep driving cost out. So there's this, this race to get lower cost energy. There's a race to build a stronger machine. And we go through these cycles because when new technology comes out that is, you know, two or three times better or more efficient than the prior generation, people want to upgrade to that equipment. And what it does is it forces, as, as we upgrade, it forces out the weak hands, right? So it forces out the people with high operating costs. It focus, for, for, uh, forces out the people that have older technology. And what happens is it, the Bitcoin network just gets bigger and stronger and more secure each time this happens. And so we go through these cycles and they're, they tend to be, you know, 18 to 24 month cycles, sometimes, you know, a little bit longer. Um, and it really depends on how fast they can innovate the, the chips. Um, so you have to understand where we are in those cycles and which machines to purchase. Um, and it's interesting because you almost have to bet counter cyclical, right? So I don't think it's much different than probably, you know, exploring for natural gas or oil or like there's times to be investing in the space and there's times to be pulling away. And right now we were very bullish on where this is going. We think that the latest generation equipment is going to be here for several years. We think it's a great time to invest. And when I tell people, because I get this, I get asked this question all the time. I'm like, look at the minute all your online calculators say it's time to mine, it's too late. You you won't be able to get the machines. If you can, you're going to overpay for them. Uh, it's it's kind of you've got to be able to make that bet before that happens. Like you want the machines plugged in mining when this thing goes up. So we think it's a great time right now. 
Absolutely. And then talk a little bit about the process of actually upgrading a facility. So somebody's got a facility, they've got older equipment in there, they're mining, uh, there's revenue coming in the door, you guys go to them and kind of how do you work with them? What does your product suite or service suite look like in terms of how you can actually help that miner upgrade? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, um, so we created a product for you using the equipment as collateral, which was something that really hadn't been done in the space before. And we've deployed, you know, we've deployed a hundred million dollars into North American mining this year. Um, and so what we do is we allow miners to, to get some leverage on, 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 you know, they, they typically don't have a lot of cash sitting around. Right. So, um, we allow them to, to get their new machines, plug them in, and then, you know, we take a monthly, uh, you know, interest and, and principal payment and we let the machines pay for themselves, you know, over the course of the next, you know, 12 or 18 months. Um, we also provide advisory services. So we help people, um, think through their, their business, their, um, you know, how to avoid a lot of the, the traps that there, there is in, in Bitcoin mining. Like you really, you only have to make a couple of missteps and lose all your money, you know? So I would say that if there's anybody that's looking to deploy a lot of money into mining, call us first and we can kind of talk you through it, you know, like why this is either a good idea or a bad idea. And uh, we can definitely help, help you find the right people in the market. So like we don't have any of our own facilities. Um, so we, we've done a lot of due diligence to find out who the best operators are in North America who, who, where the best costs are, where you can put your machines and feel good about it. Um, and then we have a very strong working relationship with micro BT and with Bitmain, you know, so we talk to them daily and, um, you know, they're very excited about growing the North American market. They see it as a, as a huge opportunity. Yeah. Uh, can you name any of the people that you have kind of put a thumbs up on in terms of miners in the U S or do you want to refrain from that? You know, so I, was, I was thinking about that. I, I'm sure they would all love me f- to, to name each one. And then I'll probably forget somebody and I'll get in a lot of trouble. Um, so we'll, you know, over the next couple months, I think we'll be more and more vocal about who, who um, we're, we're working with. Um, but there's a lot of great operators in North America. And they've, you know, they spent the last three years building out, you know, large scale mining and North America, you know, everyone loves to talk about the Chinese and, and all the stuff they're doing with, with hash rate. I would love, you know, my goal is three years that it's no longer a storyline. Like we don't talk about it anymore because the hash rate is more, you know, evenly spread out throughout the world. And North America has got a ton of advantages. I mean, it's, we have a lot of power in this country. Um, and, and in Canada, um, I think the temperatures are right. The infrastructure is there and it's, you know, it's a lot of abandoned power. So we can, there's a lot of people, they, they find these spots, they step in and, and, and a lot of the local communities are figuring this out and they're embracing it. They're like, wow, this is a big deal. You mentioned power. Uh, one of the things that everyone loves to talk about uh, who does not like Bitcoin is you idiots are all spending all of the power. Uh, you're you literally consuming more power than some countries. Uh, stop doing that. This isn't environmentally friendly. Uh, I think usually the most popular response from uh, those who support Bitcoin or, or, or are intrigued by it is, yeah, but most of it's renewable power. Uh, kind of how do you guys just see power consumption, uh, the sources, the amount, like just talk me through you know how you guys look at that or any frameworks that you use to think about it yeah so it's great and a lot of people um like to bring that up so i think there's about eight gigawatts worth of power right now um securing the bitcoin network so there's definitely an element like if you believe in bitcoin the more power that secures it the better it is for the network and the more valuable the network is so um, and I think there's, it's, it's incredibly transparent how the, how, how much power is being used, right? Like everybody in the world knows how much power is being used for the Bitcoin network, how much power is being used to run all of our banks. You know, every time I turn around, there's like a new bank being built on a corner. I'm like, why are they building banks right now? It doesn't, this doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. Or how much energy does our military use? to secure our country and the U S dollar, right? Like you, you were, were you in the air force? I think you were in the air force, right? Army. Or, Army. Okay. You're an army guy. 
But the Air Force spends like $9 billion on fuel, right? We spend $2 billion on electricity to secure the, the Bitcoin network. Um, and I, I'd say the other piece is where, you know, the, the, with the, the Bitcoin algorithm is so ruthless in terms of driving cost out that it's constantly looking for low cost energy. And what we're finding is there's lots of pockets of this around the world. Um, where it actually helps the grid, it helps the power grid, it makes it more efficient. You know, there's there's peaker plants in New York, the Greenwich guys, they're the, you know, they're a great team there where they're actually, they've got an on-site Bitcoin mining facility and it allows them to be more efficient to power the grid. And it's like, wow. Or my other favorite is like New York, you live in New York, I, I live in New York, right? We have an abundance of hydropower that just, fl- it just flows over the dam. And it's like, guys, you could be making money off of that right now. And it's just going unused. And they, and they can't get their heads wrapped around it yet. But I, we think that's changing very quickly. I mean, I think in the future, um, we've, we, for, we believe very strongly that the, the uh, electric companies, the power producers, they're, they're going to get engaged in this industry. Um, we're already starting to see it. Uh, and I, th- I think nation states at some point are going to are going to say, oh, wow, we, we got to get a Bitcoin strategy and we've got these natural resources. Let's use it to produce Bitcoin. People don't I don't think like the fact that it's Iran, but I think Iran created a process to license people to mine within the country and even put some of their national resources, uh, not, not natural, but national resources towards doing it. It sounds like you think that uh, maybe some of the more fringe locations will do it first, but actually we should see uh, every nation state eventually do this? I, I think so. I mean, every nation yeah. state has a strategy around oil. They have a strategy around natural gas. They have a strategy around gold. And I think they're going to have a strategy around Bitcoin. And I think part of that strategy is we can produce it. We have a we have an advantage and we need to take advantage of you know, use that advantage to produce Bitcoin. Um, I think it's just a matter of time. Like, where where does this go? It's it's moving so fast that I, I think it's inevitable that it's going to happen. And our goal at Foundry is, you know, when when that nation state is ready to get into the space, you know, we hope that they call us because we've got the experience and the, the trust to help them kind of navigate through that. Is there any specific inflection point that you guys are looking at for, say, like the U.S. government or other kind of global superpower that would really push them or accelerate them into doing this? Um, I don't know. I think it's it's kind of like once it starts, it's going to be hard to stop. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, some of the companies now that are investing in in uh, their their treasury into crypto. Right. It's. I think all of a sudden it's like, wait, they're doing what? And wait, they're hot, they're making how much money on this? And why are they doing it? And why aren't we doing it? You know, and I think it's just a matter of time before every country is going to be asking that that question. Yeah. You mentioned North America a couple of times um, yeah. in, in kind of the hash rate distribution. Talk through a little bit of like, where are we uh, from North American hash rate and kind of how you guys see that being important to kind of continue to increase uh, on a global distribution basis? You know, it's really hard to tell exactly the distribution of hash rate around the world, but some studies like the Cambridge study, I think puts China at over 60%. Um, I think there, I think there's a lot more in the U S than, than they've gotten in the calculations, but I think we're probably in the 10 to 15% range right now. And I think over the next 24 months, it's probably going to double. Um, I think there's, there's going to be more and more capital flowing into North American miners. The facilities have been built out. There's some really big projects that are going to be announced soon um, for additional capacity. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a limit of, there's a limit at the wafer production uh, facility. So TSMC and Samsung, they, they can only give so many wafers to the ASIC manufacturers. So there's only so many machines available. And I think as long as we continue to, to buy those machines, we're going to start seeing the hash rate shift from 
um, from China, North America. And look, at I don't think North America should dominate either. I think it needs to be evenly spread throughout the, the world. That's what makes Bitcoin, you know, great. Absolutely. What's the biggest risk that you see to the mining business, whether it's here in North America or elsewhere? Biggest risk. You know, it's one of the most efficient markets, right? So I was going to, my first reaction was, oh, if, if Bitcoin price tanks, you know, oh no. But it, it, as you know, every, you know, what was it 2000, it's like 2000 blocks or something like that. Every 14 days, the difficulty readjusts. So it, it self-regulates. And you, know, you think about like the oil industry, they, you got a bunch of guys sitting in a room deciding how much oil they should pump out or not. And what are we going to do to fix the price? And it doesn't have the algorithm decides that, you know, and, and everybody in the world collectively mining kind of decides that. So if Bitcoin price tanked, hash rate's going to tank, difficulty is going to tank, and then it'll make sense to mine again. Right. So, um, so I don't know what the, I don't see any major risks right now. I, I suppose, I suppose the U S government printing more and more money and we had to, you know, economic ruin that, that would be detrimental to a lot of folks, but. And, and in terms of how you guys see um, kind of the mining cycles and some of those risks, does it feel like there's just much more knowledge in the market? Like that's what I'm kind of pulling here. Or I'm taking away from you is like, there's just so many more experienced miners and people who have kind of seen multiple cycles now. And so they feel like um, there's a better understanding of some of the risks or potholes, you know, kind of in the, in the strategies, but also the market cycles and kind of what to do, how to scale, how to build out these facilities that miners should be in a better position kind of moving forward through future market cycles. Oh, ab- absolutely. I mean, I think the industry is, it's maturing at this incredible pace and it looks very different today than it did a year ago. I mean, today there's, you know, we're financing equipment manufacturers. A year ago, every miner in North America was begging for that solution and it didn't look like anybody would ever step up and do it. Um, so it, it's, it's changing quickly. I mean, we're even, you know, we're looking at the derivatives market, right? So like miners, I've always said like miners are really good at making a Bitcoin and doing it really efficiently but most of them are horrible at treasury management. I know I can speak for myself. Like I didn't know what to do. I'd mine this Bitcoin and sometimes we'd sell it every day and others was like, no, let's hold it and let's try to time the market. And it was just a mess. Um, so we're working with like the Genesis team and we're selling um, forward or calls um, on, you know, future production. And it's like, wow, we're, we're actually making we're making extra money doing this and it's not hurting our operation and it's a better way to manage our cash flow. And it's like, whoa, this is really cool. And our, our goal is how do we train and help other miners take advantage of that stuff so that they can, you know, shore up their operations and, and be more profitable. Yeah. And, and it's one of these weird businesses too, right? Where like, what other business does your balance sheet expand? Like the actual value of your balance sheet can expand or shrink at a very <laughs> rapid rate, right? <laughs> yeah. It's scary. It can be very scary. And, and so really, it, is it fair to say that most miners are one, infrastructure investors, right? Two, they have to um, drive the cash flow from the mining activity. But then three, also, it's almost like they're uh, traders or um, that treasury management you're talking about. Like there's multiple components to this business and you've got to be pretty good, if not great, at all of them to be successful. Yeah, I, I think you, you sum it up very well. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think... Um, I'm starting to view mining almost like um, critical infrastructure, you know, so like almost like a utility, right? So I think a lot of miners, I think they come into it with a little bit of a wrong approach of we're going to, you know, get rich quick. And I've yet to meet any of those guys, you know, so um, I don't think it's a get rich quick kind of business, you know, kind of like a utility is not a get rich quick business. I think mining, is over time is going to become a very stable industry, very predictable. It's going to, you know, kind of produce a a dividend for its investors. And I think if you want to get rich quick, just go buy Bitcoin. 
Yeah. Well, and I think that's part of the uh, decision people have to make, right? Is do you want to just invest in the asset itself? Or if you go ahead and you invest in mining, the idea is that those machines will generate more Bitcoin over time than you could buy right now with the same dollar amount. Right. Um, and that's a calculation that, to your point, really depends on price, on market cycle, on the technology you buy, the, the uh, shelf life of that technology, how uh, expensive is the power, what's the source of your power. Like, there's a lot, a lot of inputs here. And if you're sophisticated and you know what you're doing, it's great business to be in. If, uh, if you're not, good luck. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, what, what has been some of your biggest takeaways? So you guys have invested $100 million or so uh, into mining. Uh, you've partnered up with, uh, with DCG to do this. What's been kind of your biggest takeaways in 2020? The, the world's been chaotic and, and uh, in so many ways, but kind of from a business perspective, what's been the one or two surprises or takeaways that you've had? So early in the year, um, I, I think for me personally, a couple surprises is the... Like the I the DCG team is amazing, right? Like I I thoroughly they're just a great group of people. I thoroughly enjoy working there. They they have probably a better better outlook or look into the you know the whole blockchain space than anybody else. So they really understand it and they understand the risks and the rewards and. And uh, Barry's been really supportive. He's like, look at Mike, you don't have to hit home run, just get on base. Like we just need to get on base on, you know, a regular, you know, cadence. Um, and, and this idea of betting counter cyclical, I think is, is really, really important. So we placed some really be big bets early on the micro BT guys. They basically said, Mike, get your machines installed, help your customers. Um, and you're going to be just fine. And they've been right. You know, so you know, all the online calculators would tell you that, you know, the payback is 18 months for the new equipment. It was the same thing in May. And yet I've been mining with the equipment for six months and it's worth, the equipment's worth more today than what I bought it at. And I've been mining for six months. You know, it's like, I think this is actually going to hold true for quite some time because we're early in the cycle. So um, I really encourage, you know, people, if you're, I, I've, I've told a lot of people, like, if you, if you don't think now's a good time to get into the mining space, you should just buy Bitcoin. Like if you're struggling today with this decision, um, then this isn't the right space for you. One of the last things I want to do before, uh, before we get into some of the rapid fire stuff is um, help people understand the unit economics. So, Again, a lot of these are variables that will change depending on your location, your operations, all this kind of stuff. But just generally, uh, if somebody buys one miner uh, and they were to plug it in, kind of how do you guys look at um, you know the average cost on a power side? And then like, what does that look like over, let's say, 24 months or something like that in terms of uh, how much they can actually generate if they do it the right way, right? So they come to your advisory services, you guys, you know, kind of walk them through, here's what to do. What does that unit economics look like in, in kind of the bull case? Yeah, so I think I think most miners want their machines to pay back in less than twelve months, right? And when when the industry gets really frothy, or when it did the last time, it was like machines were paying back in in three months, four months. You know, it was like you you plugged it in and you got all your money back, and it was amazing. I think one of the important things to look at is how long do you think the machines are going to last, um, and I, and how efficient are the machines that you're buying. Because that's going to extend their life cycle, right? So we're, we, we believe that these current generation machines will last three, probably four years. So you kind of have to look at that overall time frame. And, and part of this is, look, at, you, could buy, you could buy Bitcoin at a high price and the market could fall. But while it falls, you're losing money if you just bought the coin. If you're mining you're still making money through that whole process, right? So the machines are still paying for themselves. So it's a little bit of a hedge for the downside. Um, and then you, you kind of get all the upside if you get them plugged in before, before the market really runs. Um, so you got to buy them. I, I always tell people, you got to buy them at the right price. You have to pick up a, a provider that can get them installed um, when they arrive. And you got to have a, a low hosting cost and that those hosting costs continue to drift down. And then, you know, have a, have somebody that you really trust in terms of, of running the machines for you. Cause they've got to be up and running all the time. 
Yeah, makes sense. What does success look like for Foundry? If you look out 10, 15 years from now, what exactly are you guys doing? And you're like, you know what? We did exactly what we wanted to. Yeah, so uh, when I started, Barry said, look at it. I want you to build a business for the next 10 to 20 years, right? Like everybody looks so short term in this industry. It's this is this is for the long haul. And I think 10 years from now, I, I really do think nation states will be in the mining business somehow, some way. And I think uh, we'll be their first phone call to, to help them through that process. Uh, I also think that, you know, we didn't spend much time talking about, but the proof of stake world, I think is going to be fascinating over the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, it's still early on, but you know, these teams have been heads down building for the last three years. You know, even like today's a big day, Filecoin launched, right? Like they've been working on this thing for, for three plus years and it just went live today. And there's so many other proof of stake protocols out there that are going live that the teams have been working for years on. And I just think that's going to, it's going to be really interesting to see how that all, all plays out. Absolutely. I always ask the same two questions to everyone before I, uh, I finish up. Uh, first is most important book. What do you got for me? Yeah. So, um, so most important book I would, you know, I think there's different books at different parts of times in my life that have been like the most important book. Um, I'll tell you when I was a young kid, I really struggled to read. Um, so when like early grade school, that's probably why I became an engineer because I, I wasn't good at reading and writing. And, um, so now I love to read, you know, like now I just can't, I can't take enough of it in, but you know, probably the most impactful book for me was a book called a grace given. Um, by, by a, na- a guy named, uh, Kent Gilgis. And, uh, it's about a father's journey, uh, in losing their, their, his daughter. And, uh, in 2007, my four-year-old passed away. Uh, she had a bad heart and it was a really, really tough time. in you know, obviously in my life and I got a chance to meet the author and read the book and it was like, wow, here's somebody who was having the exact same, you know, crazy thoughts I was having. And it really, it really helped me to know that I I wasn't alone, you know, in the journey. And it really, you know, um, it it was, it was just a big impact for me. So highly recommend it. It's, it's, um, you know, it's a sad book, but it's, uh, also very hopeful book. And, uh, and we've been blessed that we were blessed to have another child. So, um, it's been, uh, it's been quite the journey. Yeah. That, that's, that's, uh, it's always, um, the timing at which you read books is almost as important as, uh, the actual book that you read. Right. And that's something Absolutely. that over, over all of these episodes, uh, has come out over and over and over again. So, uh, so that's a great recommendation. Uh, the second one is a little bit more fun aliens, believer or non-believer. Uh, yeah, I'm a believer, you know, like the math just seems to be there. I I was thinking about this, like we only discovered gravity like 350 years ago, like there's 500 years ago, people still thought the earth was flat. Like we know so little about, about our own world, let alone the universe that I just think there's so much more to, to be discovered. I mean, even Absolutely. Bitcoin, Bitcoin's only been here for 10 years, you know, like. <laughs> very true. Very, very true. Um, do you believe that we're in a simulation or are you just sticking with the alien stuff? Oh, I was that, that I wasn't prepared for that question. <laughs> um, you know, I love to, you know, those things are always fun to think about, right? Like somebody came back and Satoshi came from the future and, you know. I don't know if I go that far on that one. <laughs> or, you know, like, uh you know, like the machines, I, I love the fact that we're building, we're building a computer that can never be shut down. And, and, and the computer is incentivizing us to go do it. And we are totally like hook, line, sinker. We are all in and trying to build this thing as fast as we possibly can. And, you know, transferring value is just one level on what's going to, what this thing's going to be able to do. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. 
I, uh, I tend to think it is uh, absolutely wild that we found ourselves in this situation, but I'm glad to be alive right now. Yeah, me too. What, uh, what one question you got for me to finish up? So I don't know. People have asked you like 400 questions or something. So it's hard to, and this one's probably been asked in the past, but um, what do you think is the biggest threat to Bitcoin besides government takeover or, you know, 51% attack or like self-inflicted what? wound. Like somebody introduces code that ends up having a bug in it. I think that's by far like, that's the most likely thing to happen, right? I don't think that it is likely to happen, but the thing that is, uh, has the highest chance of happening is that even more so than governments or any of the other things that people love to kind of talk about. Um, but it's still such a, such a small, uh, you know, chance that that would even happen, um, which also speaks to like how unlikely it is that a government is able to shut down the Bitcoin network or a 51% attack happens or anything like that. Um, so self-inflicted wound definitely is one. Uh, and then two is, um, you know, somewhat tangentially related. Like it just takes time from like a branding and marketing standpoint, like, People, you know, I, I used to joke, I'd walk into uh, institutions and meet with their investment committees uh, or their investment teams. I'm like, oh, this sounds awesome. Where can we learn more? And like, what am I going to be like? Well, you can go follow Crypto Panda on Twitter. Like, no, right? Like, <laughs> and, and by the way, like, that's not a knock against a pseudonymous account, right? Of any of, any of them. Like, actually, that's where most of the best information right. is, right? <laughs> or like, oh, you should go to this Telegram channel. They're like, what the hell's Telegram, right? So, so it's like, by the way, that's where the best information is. So I think that like, it, it's just, it takes time to kind of build out all of the infrastructure and, and kind of sophistication that they're used to, to make them comfortable with uh, understanding it. Um, and we're getting there, but you know, it just takes time to do this stuff. Yeah, I, pe people ask me all the time, like, can you explain Bitcoin or blockchain? And I'm like, look, at you You can watch Netflix on your phone. Do you have any idea how that technically works? Like, do you know the difference between TCP and IP? And uh, uh, they're like, no, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <You> know, just, <laughs> just believe. <laughs> what, what, what's the uh, Satoshi line? Like, uh, if you don't if you don't believe in Bitcoin, I don't have time to explain it to you or something. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, all right, Mike, listen, thank you so much for doing this. Where can, uh, where can people find you and more about Foundry on the internet? Uh, FoundryDigital.com is, um, I think the best place to get us. Um, Twitter handle for me is call your mic. Um, Twitter handle for Foundry is Foundry services. So yeah, we're, we're looking forward to, uh, the next 12 months. I think it's going to be a great, it's going to be an exciting ride. I, uh, I tend to agree. And yeah. uh, I don't think anyone believes that you or I have any other opinion than what we have. So <laughs> that's right. I'm <laughs> sure on the table, let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it. <laughs> we placed our bet. <laughs> exactly. All right, Mike, listen, thank you okay. so much for doing this. We'll definitely have to do it again in the future. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. I'll see you. Bye.